One of the most important painters of the Renaissance is Masaccio. You might even argue that he is the most important because he is considered to be the first fully Renaissance artist. He uses all of the uh, techniques that we associate with Renaissance art. And indeed, long after his death, uh, artists in Florence would come and learn to draw by you know, drawing from his, uh, his paintings. It said that Michelangelo did that, you know, he, um, drew from Masaccio. He had a tragically short life, as you can see. Uh, he was born December 21st of 1401, and he died in November of 1428. So, you know, he only lived to be 26 years old, almost, almost 27, but not quite. Um, he was born in a small town, Castella uh, San Giovanni, and he went to Florence and worked in Florence. And then he went down to Rome, which turned out to be a bad move. Um, he was killed, and I'm not sure whether it was a, a, a mugging or a barroom brawl or something, but he was, he was supposed to be knifed uh, and murdered. In just a few years, essentially he's, he's changed the way that the artist paints, and he should be one of the premier names. Uh, that you know, I, I always think that you know, everybody should know his name. <laughs> this is so very important. Um, his name actually is a nickname. His actual name would be Tommaso, and Maso is uh, essentially Italian for Tom. Uh, Tommaso is you know, Thomas, and then Maso uh, is the shortened version. But there were two painters from towns that were fairly close to each other, uh, who came to Florence about the same time, and they both were named Tom, or Masso. And so um, they were given nicknames, Masaccio and Mausolino, and we'll hear a little bit about Mausolino later. Um, Mausolino meant fine Tom. Masaccio, yeah, you keep reading different translations, but it's something like rough, sloppy, crude, ugly, Tom. What do they mean? I mean, you know, was Masaccio a, uh, a messy guy? You know, big and rough and sloppy and crude. Uh, was it his appearance they were talking about and the other guy was much, much more fine? Or are they talking about their painting styles? Because Masaccio does have a broad, um, monumental style compared to uh, Masolino. Um, so we're not sure. They're talking about their painting, they're talking about their person. But uh, they have gone down in history as Masaccio and Masolino. And as I say, he is the first uh, truly or completely Renaissance painter. Uh, he creates the illusion of believable space on a flat surface using all of the devices, including, as we'll see eventually, linear perspective. So things we've seen before, like foreshortening um, and uh, atmospheric perspective, uh, uh, use of uh, modeling in light and dark. Uh, he uses these, uh, and he also adds a couple of other things. Uh, well, the linear perspective I mentioned, and we we have a little surprise for you. Okay, okay. This is a remarkable discovery. This is the San Giovanale triptych. Um, it's a Madonna and child enthroned with the saints in the side panels. Um, and when I say it's a remarkable discovery, it was discovered in 1961. 1961? It, it's, it boggles the mind. How 
How could you find a new Renaissance painting that wasn't known before? Uh, but they did. Uh, and they believe it was for the church of San Giovanale uh, in uh, Casio di uh, Reglio. So small town, uh, and this was its altarpiece. And that's near where Masaccio was born and where he grew up. So you know, this might have been one of his earliest commissions. It is dated. This inscription is on it. And as you can see, you know, it is dated exactly, possibly the day he finished it, uh, April 23rd, 1422, which makes it the earliest Masaccio that we know of. He's not got everything completely mastered, but there's a lot of interesting things going on in his uh, representation. Uh, it's now in the Uffizi, and we want to look at this and see some of the things that he's doing, and then we will be able to compare it with a, a, a picture from just a few years later and see how much he's progressed. Well, you see things that, well, I should mention that the um, condition of the painting uh, is, is pretty bad. I think you can look at this and see, uh, even with your naked eye, you know, a lot of different paint losses. But what do you have? You have a, a kind of maybe homely Madonna. Uh, you know, she's not this ideal queenly figure. Um, and so, you know, sort of an ordinary woman, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, they do have the gold disc halos. The background uh, was uh, was gold. Some of it's perhaps come off. Uh, and the trichet is, is held uh, a lot, uh, erect uh, by Mary. So we're seeing, uh, you know, the whole little baby Christ child um, with his fingers in his mouth, like a baby. I mean, he looks like a baby. Uh, but that stiffness of the pose, you know, suggests um, other things, perhaps uh, a reference to the death of Christ. Now, when we look at the throne, we have this architectural throne, um, and we'd say, well, he's not quite consistent yet because we look straight at the back of the throne and then we look down at the um, curving step that leads up to it, the footrest, as it were. Uh, we, it's hard to say anything about the modeling because there's so much paint loss in Mary's garment. Uh, so we can look at some of the other sections. Uh, for example, the angels. Now there's little paint losses there, but we can still see that he has modeled the angels in light and dark. And they are turned away from the viewer. This kind of lost profile. Uh, you know, almost a completely back view, but not quite. Uh, and because we're standing here facing the same direction, they seem to draw our eye into the painting. Okay, so you want to compare it with Giotto. Over a hundred years earlier, the baby looks much more baby-like. The angels turn even more. Uh, they don't look like bolder people, you know, they've got these, these uh, they're a little more slender and they've got their uh, colorful wings and that draws our eye in. Um, what uh, Giotto did was have the, the angels parallel to the picture plane uh, in profile kneeling on either side of the step, which also, you know, uh, emphasize the fact that we what, could come up the step maybe or Mary could have come up the step. Um, and here, with Masaccio, you know, we're actually looking the same way as the angels being drawn in. Let's compare that to something that's a little bit later. Incidentally, both of these would be tempera paint, the water-based paint, on panel with, of course, the gold leaf uh, backgrounds and halos. This is the Madonna and Child from a painting known as the Pisa Polyptic because it was a commission for Santa Maria del Carmine in Pisa, and Vasari describes it. And um, the pieces started to be identified in the 19th century. It's broken up, it's not um, still a polyptic. Uh, there's bits and pieces of it in, in different museums. The main um, subject, the Madonna and Child, which we see here, is now in the National Gallery in London. 
and it is from 1426. So four years after the work we just saw. Let's look at some of the things that he has accomplished in this time, because now we have what could be a fully realized uh, Renaissance Madonna. He's now in uh, control of his uh, technique. Uh, he is showing space consistently. He's showing monumental figures. Uh, this is uh, figures that are rounded in light and dark, and you see the drapery. Once again, there's you know, paint losses, but the draperies that wrap uh, the bodies uh, and, uh, you know, with large folds that come over Mary's knees, and we're you know, quite certain that she is seated on that architectural throne, which has classical motifs. It's like little Corinthian columns on it. And our view is consistent. We're not looking down and looking up both. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at this um, as a consistent point of view. Uh, we have the little angels. Uh, two of them beside the throne uh, are partially covered up by the throne. In fact, one of them's face is partially covered up. And then you have the two musical angels seated on the step making music. They're playing lutes. And they are, the lutes are foreshortened. And this is a motif that goes continually through Renaissance art. You know, little angels, musical angels playing music at the foot of the enthroned Madonna. Uh, they turn in space. You know, one of them is sort of a little more than three-quarter view for the face and the bodies in three the other bodies are both in three-quarter view and then the other one's profile. And then there's the Christ child. Now, I kept saying there's paint losses. You notice that the bottom of his, his foot uh, looks like a, a kind of a, a dark uh, beigey, browny color. That's just filling in space where the paint is lost. Um, restorers do different things. Uh, some restorers want to make you think that what they have added to the painting uh, is really what the artist did. You know? uh, a more modern way of restoring paintings is to keep it clear what is missing and just put in enough so that it is, the, the painting doesn't look um, awry. You know, that you can read the painting clearly. Uh, and so here you do have some uh, touch-ups that you can see, such as the bottom of the Christ child's feet. Now that's a baby. <laughs> you know, he's this plump little baby. He's not stiff anymore. Uh, and he's gobbling grapes, which of course have a Eucharistic meaning. The grapes refer to the wine of the Eucharist or the Mass, uh, which um, reenacts the, the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ. And the uh, grapes are uh, uh, that make up the wine of the Eucharist are the blood of Christ. So it's a reference to the uh, sacrifice of Christ, to the crucifixion, to the blood of Christ. Uh, you know, but, uh, even though he's still a baby, uh, even he's doing baby things, you know, there's this solemn theological meaning behind it. Uh, you will notice that uniquely among the other figures in this painting, the Christ child has a elliptical halo. Uh, rather than a gold disc behind his head, the halo is foreshortened as though it's sort of um, a little say, I was going to say a little headgear <laughs> that can, uh, you know, that can be foreshortened. And here are some details. Now, Mary's calm face probably has been abraded. As I say, the condition is not far from perfect. Uh, so there may have been more details on the face, uh, maybe some more modeling. Uh, but, you know, over the years, uh, either the paints thin out or sometimes they're even, uh, some of the, the paint is actually, uh, we call it rubbed. Uh, and you can see, uh, if you look at this picture of the Christ child, you can see where the, some of those paint, huge paint losses are in the feet, Mary, one of Mary's hand supporting him, and also in the, the garment. But there's that baby. 
with his foreshortened halo, fingers in his mouth. Well, now we have a reason for the fingers in the mouth. He's reaching out with the, for the grapes and then he's presumably stuffing them in his mouth. But, uh, there are the uh, angels with the foreshortened loose, lutes. And look at the picture on the left. On the far left, where the, uh, you know, right, right be, <laughs> to the left of the angel's bottom, as it were, where the draperies are uh, uh, on the step, you can see a darker area. And then a slightly, uh, another slightly darker area uh, beside the knee. Those are cast shadows. And it seems that perhaps beneath the uh, gar the uh, hem of the Virgin, there's some dark areas that could be cast shadows. And another at the, you know, the step where Mary has her feet, uh, you can see uh, uh, another dark area. Perhaps that's another cast shadow. Um, Masaccio starts using cast shadows, and he seems to be the first person since classical antiquity uh, to consistently use cast shadows. Once he's got the idea, and we'll see this in other works where he really uses them. Um, what's a cast shadow? Well, we were talking about shadows, light and dark modeling the figures. But also, if a person or object stands between a light source, let's say the sun, <laughs> or the light coming in the window, that person stops the light. It's a, so it's a barrier and a shadow appears on the other side on the ground or the steps or you know whatever is um, you know say behind that figure. So these are shadows cast by the people or objects in the picture. Giotto didn't use them. Duccio didn't use them. We saw one example with Pietro Loren, uh, Lorenzetti uh, with that scene with the, the uh, servants and the fire and uh, the dog was casting a shadow, presumably because the light of the fire was so strong. But even Pietro didn't consistently use them. And that's a fairly unique example in the uh, 14th century. So here we're seeing the start of cast shadows, just a little bit. We'll see more later. Uh, and once again, we want to do our comparison. You know, what's this, about 116 years later, uh, what has Masaccio done to make this a fully realized Renaissance painting? Um, the figures are, as we said, monumental. Uh, the child really does look like a baby. Mary is even what, more believable than Giotto's figure with the drapery folds. They're broad, but they're well-defined and they really truly seem to wrap Mary's legs, Mary's arm, um, the, or the angels' legs, arms, bodies. They wrap the bodies. Uh, we have here a Renaissance throne made up of uh, classical columns as opposed, of course, to the Gothic throne that would have been uh, very fashionable at the time of Giotto. And we have the gold disc halo now showing as though it was an actual physical object that can be foreshortened. And with the foreshortening, of course, of the lutes. So it is a more believable work. I know, for Giotto, for his time, was amazing. Masaccio coming over a hundred years later, has surpassed him as far as the illusion of depth. But what I find interesting, because we have these dateable or dated works, it's comparing Masaccio from 1426 with Masaccio, same subject, Madonna and Child and Throne with Angels, in 1422. And you can see in four years, all of those inconsistencies and things that seem to be a little awkward, he solved those artistic problems. We have a consistent view of the throne. You know, it doesn't look like we're looking both back and down at the same time. Although we have all these paint losses, so it's hard to tell exactly what he's doing with the Mary's draperies. We are clear that the draperies wrap the body. 
uh, we have a greater use and a greater mastery of foreshortening. We have that motif of the baby who is a baby uh, continuing, but even, you know, not as stiff anymore. So a fully realized illusion of depth and solidity. Now, I'm not going to show you all of the panels that have been found that they think go with the piece apocalyptic. But I thought I would like to show you this one because of the extraordinary foreshortening in it. Uh, this was believed to be a, a pinnacle from the piece apocalyptic. And it's you know, fairly small, and it's a, a crucifixion scene. It is against the gold background, which at this time uh, was, uh, I was going to say, de rigueur uh, for a, an, all, a, you know, a, an important altarpiece. You have your timeless uh, gold that suggests heaven or something going on in a timeless quality. And also is very rich to give your, um, your finest things to the worship of God. So we have here a, a simplified crucifixion. It's not a scene where you have the, all of the holy women and all of the Roman soldiers. You just have four figures. Christ on the cross, Mary the mother, and here she is, the Stabat Mater, uh, in this very voluminous drapery. Uh, you know, she stands with her hands folded, uh, both, what, in mourning, perhaps also in prayer, uh, but she is erect in her faith. Uh, John, on the other side, you know, his hand is up to his head, a little more mourning, and then Mary Magdalene. We don't see her face at all, but we see her back, and we see this incredible dramatic gesture, which gives us the emotion, even though you don't see the face. And then if you look at the figure of Christ, you know, first you might look at it and say, well, wait a minute, what's the matter with his head? You know, it looks like just some a neck. It's just coming out of his shoulder, uh, 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 his, um, the collarbone. That's because of the placement of this. Think about it very high up on the pinnacle of a large altarpiece. So the viewer would be looking up and it would seem as Christ were looking down at him. Now we want to look at some frescoes by Masaccio. And there are two churches in Florence, in different parts of Florence, uh, that contain frescoes by Masaccio. One is in the chapel that's known as the Brancacci Chapel. That's the family name of the, their, their family chapel. And this is the chapel in the church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. Uh, St. Mary of the Carmelites. Uh, the Carmelites were a fairly austere uh, monastic or uh, friary actually, um, but a religious order and this is their church in Florence. And this is one of the side, uh, side chapels. It's not the nave. It's not the main altar. Um, but we're looking into this and you can see, um, you know, there's been work from different times. The altarpiece is an Italo-Byzantine altarpiece on the, on the uh, altar. And then up above you see later kind of Baroque uh, painting. Those aren't the things we're going to look at. We're looking at the 15th century paintings on the walls. And some of them are done by Masaccio and Mazzolino in the 1420s, probably around 1425 to 27. Um, and then they were finished up in the 1480s by Filippino Lippi. I wanted to show you, and here we're looking at the walls. Um, I guess I should tell you who did what. Uh, We'll start at, and this um, this would be as you're facing the altar, it may be the right side, and the uh, wall that is the wall against which the altar would be, um, it's a short end, as it were. Uh, you're seeing the uh, St. Peter, oh, this is, this, uh, um, this chapel is dedicated to St. Peter. Uh, and there's been all sorts of suggestions about why that is. Some of them see a political one, um, uh, thinking it's aligned with the Guelph party, uh, which was the papal party. Um, but I believe that the founder of this chapel 
the father of the person who was com commissioning uh, these works was named Peter. So it may be very simple. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, we have scenes from the life of St. Peter. And uh, you see at the upper left here on the narrow uh, part of the wall that you see is a Peter uh, baptizing neophyte by Masaccio. Uh, and uh, then the long panel is by Mazzolino. It's Miracles of Peter, which we'll take a look at later. Uh, and we'll also take a look at uh, Mazzolino's uh, Fall of Man, which we see here. Down below on the long wall, uh, you have things that uh, seem to have been started perhaps by Mas uh, Masaccio, but were finished trying to imitate the earlier style a bit uh, by Filippino Lippi. And certainly when you get down to uh, uh, the, the sleeping guard, you know, he, he really does look like the more um, uh, what elegant and somewhat elongated style of Lippi. Okay, uh, over here. Same kind of thing, only we have an expulsion by Masaccio. Uh, we have a long painting called The Tribute Money, which we will spend some time at talking about, uh, also by Masaccio. We have a painting of uh, Peter preaching, and this one's by Mazzolino. And then the lower ones, um, part of that is uh, Masaccio and part of it's finished up by Filippino Lippi. Uh, and then, uh, at the very end, on the lower part, uh, here in our view, it's the lower right, uh, is a painting I'm going to show you again, which is uh, St. Peter healing with his shadow, uh, and uh, that is by Masaccio. So, first we're going to look at this very famous uh, fresco uh, in the Brancacci Chapel, and uh, it's, it's justifiably famous. Uh, stylistically, we're going to start seeing all of these elements that we do associate with the illusion of depth and how it is created in the Renaissance, the fully Renaissance painting. Uh, and iconographically, it's fascinating. It's a very rare subject, and so we speculate, why did he paint this in a very prominent, this is a large, uh, you know, prominently placed painting. Um, and I don't think they were just trying to find something that, you know, Peter did that we can put in the painting because we got all this space, because there are many things that are not shown. And in fact, that's one of the things too, if this is really supporting the papal party, how come you don't have uh, Christ giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter, or Christ saying to the apostles, feed my sheep? Those papal scenes are not there. We've got a very different scene here. So it's uh, a very unusual New Testament scene. I always call this the IRS's favorite painting, although I don't know if IRS um, staff actually knows about it. Uh, but uh, this shows Jesus paying his taxes. It's just a few lines in Matthew 17, 24 to 27. Okay. So, let's take a look at it. What's going on here? In the, ce in the uh, center, you have Jesus but you have this man just uh, facing him, you know, to, as we look at it, to our right of Jesus, his left. Uh, and he's a remarkable figure. He's dressed in a contemporary garment for a young man. Uh, he's got his hand outstretched toward Christ, foreshortened beautifully, uh, like he's asking for something. And you might notice that when we look at the bottom of the, the feet, uh, one of his feet is raised and we're looking up from under because it's way over our heads as we look up at this fresco. Uh, and the feet are foreshortened as well too. And, uh, you know, a masterly job. You know, there's no awkwardness about these at all. Uh, so this is the tax collector. And he's got his hand out and he's saying, hey, you haven't paid your taxes. So what does Jesus do? They don't have any money. How are they going to pay their taxes? So Jesus is pointing, as you see, sort of pointing to Peter, who is and toward the Sea of Galilee. And Peter is pointing to the Sea of Galilee because what is what is Jesus saying? He's saying to Peter, go to the Sea of Galilee and catch a fish. And in the mouth of the fish, you will find a coin. And so, you know, 
it's like he's pointing, he's giving the directions to Peter. He's like, what, over there? <laughs> you know? so, uh, and that draws our eye to this other little uh, separate scene. Uh, of Peter once again. He appears three times in this fresco uh, at the uh, edge of the Sea of Galilee. He's, he's uh, got a fish. I, this is, I love this. We'll, we'll see a detail of it later. But the fish is still in the water. This is a fisherman who did not kill the fish. You know, he's just taking the coin, very kindly taking the coin out of the fish's mouth. And then he comes over and on our far, our far right, uh, we see Peter again and we see the tax collector and Peter is paying the tax collector. So Jesus pays his taxes. Now, why would you ever have such a scene? It's, as I say, it's a very rare scene. I can't think of any example prior to this. Uh, the only example I know of that's called the tribute money, I saw a painting uh, from a much later date in the Vatican, and I really wasn't convinced it was this subject. I thought it might very well be a related subject, which is the render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God, uh, holding up the coin. Um, so why would they show this subject? Well, there's a number of theories. But one somewhat older one uh, by Longhi is really totally speculation. There's no documentation. He says, well, maybe uh, Mausolina was supposed to do the Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven story, uh, which Masaccio altered. But this doesn't make any sense at all. The artists do not choose the subjects. The patron chooses the subjects. And the patron, uh, and they would, you know, be a negotiation. The patron would have um, in the contract, there'd be a series of payments. There'd be payments for the pigments, especially the expensive ones. Uh, how much is going to be paid for this? How much for that? And usually a schedule of operations is, you know, once you get this much done, you get paid for something. Um, but it is the patron, Signor Brancacci, who will choose the subject. And being in a Carmelite church, um, it might be that the prior, for example, advised him and advised the artist on uh, you know, what subjects to choose. Um, we don't have documentation of that, but that might be logical. But it's not Masaccio's business to go in and change things around. And, and as I said, that's theory, no facts. Millard Meads thought that because St. Augustine says that Christ was not required to pay the tax. It was a kind of reference to the passion of Christ. Christ was not required to die to save the sins of mankind. He chose to do it so that human beings could go to heaven. Now, I say uh, his death atones or uh, for all of the sins of mankind. But, you know, he was God. He didn't have to do it, but he chose to. So, you know, he's above the Romans who are collecting taxes, but he goes ahead and pays the taxes. Well, that's nice, but why the taxes? I mean, how many people are going to know that bit of theology? Antol suggests that this is a kind of allegory for the uh, money earned by maritime ventures in which uh, Brancacci earned money. But really, I mean, granted, there is a water there, the Sea of Galilee, and there's a fish. But other than that, you know, it's, it's really not showing maritime commerce. It's a sacred setting. And it's appropriate to the subject. So... Some ideas that perhaps fit a little better with the time have to do with the catasto. The catasto is known as the first income tax in history. Um, it was a war tax. Uh, during the early 15th century, uh, Florence was besieged several times uh, by the Milanese, the Duke of Milan, by the Neapolitans, by the, under the King of Naples. And both times, um, they, they seemed to be uh, miraculously saved. Um, the soldiers got sick and had to, uh, it was a plague, an epidemic disease. Uh, they had to abandon uh, the siege. 
Uh, and on the other case, um, the ruler died and they abandoned the, uh, the siege. So Florence felt that God was protecting them. But, you know, it's prudent <laughs> not to just rely completely on God um, to fortify your city so that the Neapolitans, the Milanese can't get in and sack your city um, and take over your government, pillage. So um, there was a tax to support the war effort to pay for the protection of Florence, uh, known as the Cadasto. And essentially it was an income tax on income producing property. So a little bit different than you know, our income tax today. Um, we do something I think kind of odd today. We tax property like people's homes that do not generate income. And we've probably all heard horrible stories about people who have, you know, paid their taxes for years and lose their job and lose their house. Or people who get very elderly and, um, you know, either they run out of money or sometimes they're sick uh, in the hospital. They don't get the tax bill and, uh, you know, they lose their house. I always thought that was horrible that taxes should be on income. <laughs> Nobody asked me, uh, but that's what this was. This was a tax on income producing property. Now, what does that mean? It means if you are a rich landowner who owned, let's say, farms out in the country, you own houses that you rent out in the city, you pay taxes on that property. You don't pay it if it's not generating income, say your own personal home. If you are a craftsperson, you pay taxes on your tools. Let's say you're a carpenter, you pay taxes on your hammer and saw. Presumably it's not as much as if you own lots of property. In fact, it was, it was a sliding scale. And they even seem to have had a system of deductions uh, because people write in and uh, they say, well, I can't pay you know, the taxes because. And some of them elicit your sympathy, and some of them, of course, we look at, yeah, sure. Um, for example, a person, a, the carpenter says that, I'm disabled. I haven't been able to work for years. You know, I still own my tools, but I can't work, so don't tax my tools. In other words, they're not really income producing. And a rich man might say, well, I no, I have you know, lots of property, and, and, but it's very expensive being wealthy. I have to maintain a certain standard and you, know, you shouldn't tax me because there's a long history, which we can even see the repercussions in today's arguments about who should pay taxes. And some people think the rich should not pay taxes. And I find that totally bizarre. You know, um, or the rich should pay smaller taxes. Um, but yeah, in history, it's the peasants and people who don't have as big a voice in government um, who often end up paying the bill. Okay, so here is the catasto. It's supposed to be fair. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, if you don't make much money with your tools, you don't have to pay much. If you have a lot of property, you have to pay for that. Uh, income producing property. So Frederick Hart had the idea that this painting had a contemporary meaning and that it was painted in support of the Catasto. Now this war tax to protect Florence. I mean, obviously rich people want to be protected. Uh, you know, they've got all their wealth to protect, uh, just like poor people don't want to be killed. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, kind of like everybody should support the Catasto, except for one thing that makes us wonder. Hmm, Mr. Brancacci was a rich guy he did not want to pay taxes. <laughs> he didn't support the Catasto. He didn't like it at all because it meant he had to pay a lot of money. So why would he ever ask 
the painter or allow the painter to paint this very unusual subject. Okay. Some other articles came out also suggesting that it had to do with the Carasto, but a somewhat different meaning. Because, and this was um, Molo and Moran are the authors. Uh, this, one of the issues was that many of the religious orders, and there were many, many religious orders uh, in Florence, and many of them owned a lot of income producing property. And I have now forgotten they had the statistics, but you know whether it was 50% or 75% or whatever, I don't remember. But it was a lot. You know, they owned a, whole, most of the, a good chunk of the income-producing property in Florence. And of course, as we often hear from religious organizations, well, we're religious. We shouldn't have to pay taxes. Now, they weren't asking to pay taxes, let's say, on the church building, anything that was used for religion that didn't produce income. But the churches often owned lands, property, buildings that they rented out and got more money that way. You know, and many of the religious orders had a lot of endowed wealth. And they're saying, no, don't tax us. You know, it's like taxing God. You know, we're religious. We're God's representatives. Don't tax God. Don't tax us. A little confusion there, I guess, about who's, who's who. How would Mr. Brancacci have thought of this? He would have thought that the religious institutions needed to pay their fair tax. If he was going to have to pay tax on his property, they should pay it too. They benefit. If you don't have soldiers coming in and stealing your chalices and killing your monks and raping your nuns, you're benefiting. You're protected. So this theory says that the reason he put this painting so prominently in a Carmelite church, we might add, and the Carmelites were the, the, one of the orders that said, we shouldn't pay taxes, was, I guess we would say to tweak them, it was to show support for the religious institutions paying the tax. Because after all, you know, they're saying, oh, don't tax us, you know. You know, we're God's representatives or something like this. Um, here you see, Jesus paid his taxes. So you ought to do. <laughs> and, you know, that is really in their face because, uh, you know, probably every Carmelite monk would pass that painting and see it, and it's you know, a very prominent position. I mean, you had to keep your eyes really down on the, on the ground of the nave if you're going by. I don't want to look at the Brancaccio Chapel or something not to see it, because it's, it's, it's pretty prominent. Um, and that does seem like a, an attractive idea, uh, that uh, the rich guy says, I gotta pay my taxes, you gotta pay your taxes. What do you mean? Jesus paid his taxes? You think you're better than Jesus? There's your exemplar. You're supposed to imitate Christ, right? Pay your taxes. Okay. So, pretty interesting idea. Okay, let's go back and talk about the style. Uh, the iconography is fascinating, obviously, and the, the historical possibilities are making very interesting painting. Um, we said that there were three scenes here, and this is sometimes called a simultaneous narrative. In one setting, we see three scenes. We see uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, and the tax collector in the center. And uh, Jesus is, is telling Peter to go to the Sea of Galilee. And then we see Peter with the fish getting the coin. And then on the other side, we see um, G uh, Peter paying the tax collector. So three different scenes. Christ is in the center. And it is rather a centralized composition, even though it's not exactly equal on either side. You know, we have one view on the left where it's this uh, deep vista. And then on the right, we have a building and uh, the figures are close to us. Uh, but because we have Christ in the center in this kind of semicircle, 
of the apostles around. And we really have a feeling of depth, you know, with the, the um, there seemed to be enough room for all the apostles, for one thing. Uh, and uh, they're not just stacked up. Uh, and then the tax collector who is foreshortened and reaches into the space as his foot seems to project out of the space, uh, you know, this suggests this uh, uh, centralization with Christ at the center, you know, and uh, uh, our eyes go to him and then he directs our eyes to, the, uh, to Peter's orders, as it were. Um, we have beautiful landscape and we have uh, a a kind of, well, let's see. We have a kind of atmospheric perspective in the background. Uh, this used to be so dirty you couldn't see the landscape, and when they cleaned it, you know, we had this beautiful ripples in the ground and the uh, water, and uh, it's very atmospheric uh, uh, mountains and uh, the clouds. And then you have that building, because this is where you have some straight lines. And you'll notice that the straight lines do seem to recede to a vanishing point, which is about where Christ is. And it, it, some of these things aren't dated, but if this is, as many people think, just slightly earlier than the painting will be seen shortly, the uh, Trinity, then this might be very well the this is, let's say, the first extant and still existing example of linear perspective in a painting. It's not the first ones ever created, presumably. Uh, Brunelleschi's um, paintings um, of the baptistry and of the Palazzo uh, Vecchio were the first examples of linear perspective in painting, but they don't survive. We only know them from literary uh, references. So, here we see this building, you know, going back into space. Now, Masaccio was a Brunelleschi's friend, we think. <laughs> um, it seems that linear perspective, we said, was invented by Brunelleschi, and, you know, he paints these lost pictures. But where we can see it is in Masaccio's paintings and Donatello's relief sculpture. Both people, uh, we know that Donatello was a friend of, of, of Brunelleschi. Uh, he went to Rome with him. Uh, so it, you know, it seems to be that that's the uh, you know, friendship. And either Brunelleschi taught Masaccio how to do it, or he planned it for him, or something like that was going on. You notice that the figures uh, are these solid figures. Uh, even if the body's not pressing against the, the weight of the drapery, and they do seem to be very heavy, weighty draperies, um, we really have the sense that there's a body, a figure beneath them. And then, of course, we can see more of, say, the tax collector's legs. You know, we, we certainly see that. Um, So you really have this feeling of the solid figures in believable space. Uh, there's the individual features. He's tried to make each apostle look like, unlike the ones uh, around him. Uh, different beards, uh, you know, different hairstyles. Uh, some of them, of course, we can identify by their their hairstyles, as it were. Uh, uh, one, of course, is Simon Peter, who's always shown with this sort of short gray beard, and uh, it, it often has a tonsor. You might notice something else. The halos, these gold disc halos, uh, are foreshortened. It's almost like they're they're wearing them <laughs> on the the crown of their head, and they sort of tip back. And there are these ellipses, as though you know we're seeing them in in uh, depth. And we have the light and dark modeling the figures. Okay, and here we see. Um, I promised you a close-up of this. Here we see Peter taking the coin from the fish's mouth. And I, I have to admit, I just love this. The fisherman who's not killing the fish. It's just wonderful to me. <laughs> so uh, compassion to all animals. I don't know that that's what Masaccio meant, uh, but uh, it gets me. <laughs> and then Peter, uh, in his voluminous draperies, paying the tax collector. Uh, you notice, of course, there's two styles of dress. The tax collector is wearing... Oh, 1420s young man or about, you know, young man tunic, garment. Um, Peter, Christ, 
the other apostles, are wearing what I call amorphous biblical robes. Um, they're kind of based on Romans wearing togas, um, and we see them very frequently uh, where biblical figures. Uh, you have to remember, no archaeologists, so people are not going and saying, oh wait, that's anachronistic <laughs> to have different styles of dress. Uh, it just makes it more real if, say, some of the figures are dressed as contemporary people, so it's happening right there. And then look at the ground. What do you see? Cast shadows. You have here fully consistent use of cast shadows. The apostles, the light seems to be coming from the actual window above the altar, uh, and it's shining in the right direction. Uh, everything was very consistent, uh, and the figures seem to be standing you know, in the light, and so cast shadows, shadows are cast on the ground. Um, we or mentioned this with the illusion of depth, with the atmospheric perspective of the mountains, and the linear perspective of the building. We talk about shading and light and dark, uh, so that the figures appear to be solid. Uh, you can look at the drapery folds. You can also look at the uh, task collector and how the light is shining in uh, from our right uh, and is modeling his, his body, his tunic, and his legs. And then we have something called Contra Posto. Remember that? We talked about it with the Donatello. And you see this, of course, it, it, you always see it in Renaissance art or any other art that is showing you um, believable figures who have the potential for movement. Uh, if you look at, say, Christ and the apostles' feet, you do have the sense that they probably you know, have unequal weight on the feet. But where it's very, very clear is the tax collector. The weight is on one leg, the other is slightly flexed, and you just just did a tiny little bit of the foot is touching the ground, uh, and so he is uh, in contra posto. This natural twist of the body, the way people actually stand, um, the feeling as though they could take another step. And here are the uh, cast shadows. Masaccio seems to be the person who use, is the first consistent use of cast shadows since classical antiquity. Can we see the details of the tax collector? Close up. Back view, front view. He can turn in space. <laughs> and there's the detail of the fish. Just, just showing you some details of the forms. Christ, Peter. Other apostles and the tax collector. And one other figure I wanted to show you is the head of St. John. This is St. John the Evangelist, uh, known as the beloved disciple. Um, he is reputedly the uh, author of the fourth gospel and the book of Revelation. And in Scenes with Christ, he's always shown as the youngest apostle. And here he has some very distinctive features. He's got this, these golden curls, and you might notice he's got this very, very strong, rounded jaw and straight nose. In other words, he has the kind of features that you see on Roman statuary. So those features probably are borrowed from an actual Roman statue. And so here you have um, classical form in Christian art. The two scenes in the Brancacci Chapel walls that do not refer to Peter are scenes of Adam and Eve. On one side, and we'll see this later, is the fall of man when uh, Adam and Eve take the forbidden fruit and disobey God, and that's the original sin. And Mausolino created that. Masaccio created the expulsion, the expulsion from Eden, where the um, first parents, Adam and Eve, are being driven out of the earthly paradise. And it's, it's a remarkable picture. Um, we don't see the garden. It's you know, a narrow section of the, the wall. Uh, we see this archway that is um, 
foreshortened. It's turned on its side a little bit. Uh, gives us a sense of space. Uh, and Adam and Eve has stepped out. You can see that Adam's foot is still uh, under the arch, as it were. He has not made the last step out into the world. Um, Adam and Eve were punished by being expelled from the earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden. And so here they are driven out by the angel who uh, has the fiery sword. In this case, the angel has a sword and the, the color of uh, the angel's garment is somewhat uh, fiery, uh, this warm hue, and even the clouds on which the angel kneels uh, are uh, warm uh, hues. Um, the angel you might show, see is, is fairly dramatic. Uh, there's some foreshortening going on, uh, you know, sort of uh, lunging forward, you know, really this, this forceful feeling. And then you have Adam and Eve. There's probably more understanding of anatomy than, you know, the other artists who precede him. And we also see this dramatic emotional moment with a strong contrast of light and dark and gestures you know, telling the story. Uh, we do have a sense of space. You know, that was the angel who seems to they're pushing them forth. Uh, we see them as a three-quarter view. They're striding forth uh, unhappily. And so here we're looking uh, closer and you can see that when you look at, for example, Eve's face, her head is thrown back. Her, you know, her eyes are just dark uh, slits. Uh, the mouth is just once again open, but it's dark. We're not seeing a lot of details. I mean, who could see tiny details? It's way up high. Uh, he shows with broad strokes in a sense. He's showing Eve as though she is crying out, lamenting. Adam, and so you're seeing kind of this, the same type of emotions, they're very sorrowful, uh, is covering his face. And yet we still have that sense of um, grief, guilt, you know, in the gesture, in the poses. And the pose of Eve actually has a reference from classical antiquity. Um, you'll see this statue a few times throughout the course. Uh, it is known as the Medici Venus. It was in the Pitti Palace, now it is in the Uffizi, and it was owned by the Medici, hence the Medici Venus. Uh, it is a Roman classical statue that seems to have been well known in the Renaissance. Uh, and it's the type of Venus called the modest Venus, where uh, Venus is uh, partially covering her breast with one hand and covering her genitalia with the, the other hand. So here, Masaccio has adapted that pose so that Eve is covering her breast, covering her genitalia. Presumably, you know, now they know that they are naked and they are ashamed, says the Bible. So for shame, uh, it's a different, a whole different feeling. Um, but it may have been suggested, uh, uh, once again, a classical element, classical reference uh, within Christian art. I wanted particularly this painting once again, a very unusual subject. I don't know of another example of this subject. I mean, maybe there is, but I don't know of it. It's St. Peter healing with his shadow. So, you know, Peter's walking down the street. St. John seems to be right behind him. And as he walks down the street, the beggars who are at the road, and uh, you know, many of them, you can see the, the, the person in the foreground, his leg is withered, and he has to pull himself along with these, um, I don't quite what to call them, they look like tiny little stools that you put your arm on and you, or your knees on, you pull yourself along. Um, these people with horrible diseases are being cured when just the shadow of Peter touches them. 
and you can see, you know, the the person who is receiving the shadow presumably soon will be healed. Uh, one person is, uh, you know, has his, his hands uh, over his uh, breast in a kind of uh, accepting and homage paying gesture. Uh, then you have the man who is uh, standing up uh, as though he is adoring, uh, you know, the, the, the person who has uh, been able to, to heal him and the person next to him who has, still has his cane, but presumably now he can walk. Uh, it's a remarkable painting, and nobody before Masaccio could have painted it. Yes, the Greeks and Romans did use cast shadows. At least we suppose the Greeks did, and we you know, can see it in some Roman paintings. But this is a Christian subject before Masaccio could have shown Peter healing with his shadow. You have to paint cast shadows to show this scene. So it's it's remarkable. Um, I also might refer you to the building. Uh, incidentally, that building is much restored. Sometimes you will see older pictures before uh, restoration, uh, the, before the newest restoration of this, and the uh, lines of the uh, rustication, these are the lines between the joints, are all out of, you know, they're not going the right, they're not going the perspective. They, it's like they're going off some other direction, and that was a restorer. Uh, I don't know why he did it that way, but he did, and now that has been fixed. And I think you can see some of the lines here. Um, but this also has a kind of reference to linear perspective. Uh, and it also has a kind of reference to uh, contemporary architecture. The rustication was used in ancient Rome, uh, but also uh, in uh, Florentine Palazzi. And we'll see if you, uh, what we'll see one uh, later, a little bit later than this. Um, and it might look down at the end of the street. There's just the little tiny tip of what a classical temple perhaps or gateway uh, with a Corinthian column. So we have a little classical element there uh, within the context of the Christian work. And of course, ancient Rome uh, was uh, had subjected and was ruling uh, ancient Palestine, ancient Judea. So, uh, you know, Roman architecture and motifs are appropriate to the time. Here we're seeing some of the details. You know, Peter doesn't even seem to notice what he's doing. It's just, you know, his virtue is coming out with the shadow. Uh, and uh, of course, he's very uh, interesting uh, figure, types of faces. Okay, we're going to talk about one last painting by Masaccio. Uh, neither of these are dated, but very frequently uh, we think that this one you know, might be just slightly later than the Brancacci Chapel. So we're dating it, but you know, maybe it's contemporary, maybe it's working on both. Um, so we dated 1425 to 28, which of course is when he went down to Rome. So that gives us a terminus. It is a fresco on the wall of the Dominican Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. It actually was discovered, the top part of it was discovered uh, in 1861, I think. It was covered up with an altar and presumably whitewashed and things like that so you can see it. And there was an altar up against the wall. And there might have been an altarpiece hanging on it. I don't know. Um, but it was discovered and you know they uncovered it. And then in 1952, I think was the year, the lower part was discovered. They pulled that altar out and there was more of the fresco. Now, you know, maybe something has been lost where the altar went right into the wall, but you've got um, this, seen at the top, the Trinity, uh, which people used to talk about as though it was the altar of the altar that was against the wall. But when you 
you know, it was an older, like an old, like a fresco as an older piece in a sense, you know, on the, the, the thing was right up against the wall. But they pulled that out and they found more of the fresco, uh, fascinating image of the skeleton lying on the um, sarcophagus with an inscription, which we're going to talk about. You know, if we just look at the top part, uh, what do we see? We see illusionistic architecture. You know, it looks like this architecture could be actually installed on the wall. Uh, you have uh, an arch with, supported by ionic columns. You have pilasters. A uh, pilaster, if you kind of think of a column that got flattened uh, against the wall, an engaged column that got squared off and flattened, uh, and classical uh, Corinthian or maybe composite uh, capitals, a little shell motif, which is another classical element, of the entablature. That's all painted there. That's not real architecture. It's painted uh, to be uh, the illusion. And then we look through the arch. We see the coffered ceiling. And remember, we're down below looking up. And you have the illusion that there is a space, you know, a, a coffered ceiling, you know, more to the chapel back there. This is another example of the, Brunel, the, the one point linear perspective that Brunelleschi worked out. And um, people who are of mathematical bent uh, have tried to draw what they think this chapel is, you know, that doesn't really exist, but is there. Uh, they, you know, they can see it as though it is such an illusionistic space, they feel it is uh, geometrically uh, almost uh, existing. I mean, of course it doesn't. It's a flat wall. And in fact, behind that wall is the um, passageway that goes into the cloister for the monastery. So um, you, you can't extend a chapel out that way. And in fact, that's kind of what the motif is in a sense. Um, the donors here who aren't kneeling uh, in the lower corners um, and praying sort of in perpetual prayer, adoring uh, the sacred figures. They don't have to build an entire chapel. They just have Masaccio paint the illusion of a chapel. Uh, they probably didn't have, you know, they, building a chapel is expensive. And, you know, painting, painting, painting is expensive, but it's not as expensive as building the chapel. So uh, they get the chapel for the price of the painting, I guess. Uh, but this is this wonderful example of the use of one-point linear perspective uh, in Masaccio's work. And he is the first artist uh, that we know of. Um, of course, we know Brunelleschi did some paintings, but Masaccio seems to be the first person who have done paintings that still survive, that have uh, one-point linear perspective in them. So this is the kind of architecture that his friend Brunelleschi, remember Brunelleschi took classical motifs, he put them together in new ways. Uh, so it's classicizing architecture. Now, the title is the Trinity. And the Trinity is uh, the way the Christians um, conceive God. Uh, so this is the tr Christian deity. And they say that this is God is three persons in one being, and the word being um, can also translate as substance. You know, it's one substance, one being, uh, but three persons. Uh, the way it's often described uh, is, you know, the sun has many rays, but they're all still part of the sun. Of course, here we only have three. Uh, now, they're called uh, by their names and uh, are represented either as human figures uh, or as uh, symbolic figures. God the Father is usually shown as a man with a, a, an older man with a gray or white beard. Uh, and he is standing here beside, behind uh, the cross of Christ as though he is supporting it. You can see his hands coming up holding the cross of Christ. God the Son is Jesus who is according to Christians, incarnate God, God who was made flesh, God who became a human being, 
great sacrifice and offered himself uh, to uh, atone for the sins of all human beings. And so he is shown on the cross, suffering, dying, as that perfect sacrifice. And then God the Holy Spirit, who is symbolized as a dove, and you see that little white, uh, white bit <laughs> uh, below the below the beard of God the Father, sort of uh, above the head of Christ. That's the dove of the Holy Spirit. It's not a collar. No, it's the dove. And uh, the reason the Holy Spirit is symbolized as a dove is because uh, in the baptism of Christ. Um, when John the Baptist baptizes Christ, uh, there was a metaphor, and it says that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. So the dove becomes the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, at the this is not a crucifixion scene. This is this is uh, something a bit different. Um, this is God the Father offering Christ as the sacrifice. Um, it's a subject that in English we often call the throne of grace. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what the Italians call it. I know in German it's the, the Nudelstuhl. Uh, no, that's not uh, Gnadenstuhl, uh, the stool or throne or seat of grace. And the grace they are referring to is the mercy. They say by the grace of God people were saved. It, God didn't have to. People didn't deserve it. But this mercy or grace allows people to be saved to go to heaven is how the, uh, the theology works. So it's not a historical representation of the, the crucifixion. It's referring to something more theological. Now there is Mary the mother in this voluminous drapery and she's not weeping or collapsing. She's actually not even looking at the cross. She's looking out at us, at the viewer. And her hand is raised and points to Christ. Who well, this draws our eye in. You know, we're looking to Mary's face. She's looking at us, we're looking at her, and she's pointing the direction. Um, this is not in Byzantine in style at all, but there's a type of Byzantine ma Madonna called the Madonna Hojatiera. It's she who points the way. So here Mary is pointing, drawing our attention to Christ who is the way to salvation. So this is salvation iconography. And John, as you can see, is adoring Christ. And it, in a way it's kind of intercessory. You know, we look at Mary, she refers us to Christ but it is salvation iconography. Now, of course, that's why it was made. It was made to help save the souls of the donors. And it also serves a theological purpose um, and it promulgates this, this uh, doctrine, this idea. And then you have below this sarcophagus with a, a skeleton on it. And there's a lot of losses here. You can see the, the top of the skull is just plain plaster because they had to fill in a hole. Uh, but uh, you can see there's a skeleton at the bottom. And then there is an inscription, and it's, he's lying on a sarcophagus, so this is his dead body. And uh, there's an inscription below, but surprisingly, the inscription is not a Latin inscription from the Bible or the Mass or something like that. The inscription is actually, it's in Italian, and it's from folklore. The, the, what it says, it's as though the skeleton is speaking to us. It says, as you are, I once was. As I am, you will become. In other words, as you are living, I once was. I was once living like you. As I am, dead, you will become. You will be dead like me. What are you going to do? And this ties in beautifully with that idea of salvation iconography. Because that's what's going to happen to your body. How can you 
be saved. How can you go to heaven? And of course, uh, there's also the Christian idea of uh, at the end of the world, at the end of time, uh, the resurrection of the body, uh, where the body and the souls are reunited. So how, how can you defeat death? And of course, um, you have to think about death. You know, memento mori. You know, we, we, that's not the inscription, but that's the type of work of art. When you have a work of art uh, that makes you think about death, you know, remember death. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. You just have to think about this. What are you going to do about it? Well, here's the answer. You know, for the you know for the belief system, it's the salvation. You with. What are you going to do about it? You're going to look to Christ and his cross. God offers the death of Christ to atone for all the sins of mankind. So you can rely on Christ's sacrifice. You can rely on the Holy Trinity here and uh, uh, this scheme to save mankind, if you will, uh, to save you from eternal death, to save you from damnation. And of course, that applies to the donors, and, and you know this is this is created to help save their souls. 